Welcome to the Ask Feliskini podcast with a guest. I'm proud to present Amir Gorham from Irvine, California. Amir is a fund manager of the Economic Defense Fund and an expert in macro, long, and short-term investment. Amir, please tell us more about yourself. What is your story? Uh, thank you. Um, well, I uh, transitioned from uh, technology, uh, technology management into uh, economics. Got my uh, PhD in economics here at uh, UC Irvine and then uh, started uh, this fund. And for people who don't know uh, what the hedge fund is, the idea or the role of a hedge fund is to generate returns even when the market uh, crash. So that's kind of the, the role. So you are expected to uh, be short, basically, the market or net short uh, when market crash. And that's where the knowledge of macroeconomics and markets uh, in general, financial markets, is, uh, is crucial. You have adapted or even improved, and now it's uh, basically your economic theory about how the market works, because the existing economic theories uh, kind of do not work as uh, we were used to. Can you elaborate a bit more about your uh, market theory and its implication to uh, economy? Yes, yes. Um, well, the, the thing that kind of uh, became obvious uh, actually this year is that the uh, stock prices kept going up and up despite interest rates uh, being increased. And that uh, contradicts most uh, economic theories. And so I uh, started to think, and I'm sure others have uh, started to think, what could be an explanation for this uh, continuous rise in stock prices despite uh, the higher interest rates. And uh, the, basically, if you want to understand the existing theories, there is the classical theory, which says that uh, when the interest rate rises, it incentivizes uh, consumers to save more and therefore it decreases consumption. And as a result, the economy shrinks. So that's the first theory that didn't really uh, happened this time. The second theory is by uh, Bernanke and others, and that's called the financial accelerator. And according to this theory, when you raise uh, the rates, you basically uh, reduce the profitability of uh, companies. And because of that, the prices of the stock uh, fall they, uh, because of lower valuations and then begins a cycle, a vicious cycle of a downward spiral of lower profits, defaults on loans, and so on and so forth. And finally, the, in finance, it is uh, widely accepted that when the interest rates on bonds are uh, high enough, and it's considered uh, to be risk-free, especially government bonds, then what would happen is that the money would flow from stocks, which are risky, to government bonds that are considered more secure. And uh, as the rates go up, they offer a much uh, safer uh, return on your, uh, on your investment. So all of these didn't happen in, uh, in 2023. Stocks kept uh, rising and rising. And I had to ask myself, uh, what is the uh, explanation for that? And so one of the uh, simplest way to understand the financial accelerator is that it kind of accelerates the entry into a recession because if today, for example, stock prices would have been uh, 20 or 30% uh, below what they are, it would probably be uh, a little bit recessionary, right? It would uh, scare people from consuming, uh, maybe uh, companies would start uh, firing employees and so on. So because that didn't happen, I proposed my uh, financial decelerator theory. And that works, that's a mechanism that works through the option market. 
And uh, it turns out that when the interest rate rises, it affects the price of uh, call options and put options, and basically makes call options uh, more expensive and put options uh, cheaper, basically reduces their value. And so it incentivizes people to buy call options. As long as they expect higher and higher rates, it incentivizes them to buy call options and to sell put options. Now, when you buy a call option while selling the put options, this is called a synthetic and basically is very similar in the return profile to just buying a stock. And so on the other side of this trade, there are option dealers that have to hedge themselves because they make money only on the spreads. And when people buy call options and sell put options, the dealers are basically uh, buying the put options and selling the call options. So they're basically exposed to the short side and they have to hedge themselves by buying stocks. And so this mechanism causes stock prices to rise as long as there is a, an expectation for higher and higher rates. And so based on this uh, theory, uh, I came up with, uh, with some predictions uh, that we can, uh, we can talk about. I would uh, thank you for this explanation. I would like your take on um, the acceleration theory and why it failed. Is it possible that it failed also be because it uh, didn't uh, consider the fiscal part of the occasion where uh, US government is spending more and more? And uh, somehow this money also comes down to, to consumers and uh, for to investments. And is it possible that the 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 theory did not prove itself to be correct because it failed to consider uh, all the fiscal stimulus that US government is putting in the system. That's uh, definitely possible. Uh, in the in the original model, there isn't actually a fiscal side at all. So it uh, the original model doesn't uh, include fiscal policy. It only has uh, uh, monetary policy. So it's absolutely possible that that was a contributor, but I don't think that is correct to say that it didn't work because in 2022, the stock market uh, fell fairly significantly. Mm -hmm. So once it was clear, once the Federal Reserve made it clear that uh, we should expect higher uh, interest rates in the future, the stock market immediately started to uh, use that uh, interest rate into its calculation of the valuations and stock market fell uh, very sharply during uh, the first half of uh, 2022. But then what happened is that uh, the actual rate started to increase. So I would say the accelerator worked while it was only an expectation for the higher rates, but then it stopped working when the rates actually started to go up in reality. Mm -hmm. and, the, and my explanation to that is the financial decelerator. So once the rates started to go up and there was clear expectation for another step and another step and another step, then uh, the financial decelerator kind of neutralized the uh, fall of the stock prices due to the accelerator. And so one of the prediction the you know, a good theory has to have to generate predictions that are testable, you know, to, to show mm -hmm. if it really works or not. So the first prediction that is testable is that the theory says that if the rate hike stop, then the accelerator would kick in again because the decelerator would stop working mm -hmm. and then the accelerator would be free to operate. And so what I said is that if indeed the, the Fed uh, stops hiking, we should see the stock prices fall despite the good news of no more uh, hikes. And that kind of happened on, uh, on Wednesday when they basically said that, uh, you know, they don't see much more rate increases. 
And uh, despite this good news, uh, the stock market fell both uh, on Wednesday and today. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's too early to, to declare a, a win, but you know, it's uh, so far so good for the, for the first prediction, at least from the initial uh, response of the market. Okay, so that is, uh, that is the first confirmation that uh, your theory um, is an upgrade to, to existing theory. Yeah. What I would like you, uh, or I would like to challenge you now to help um, the average entrepreneur that is more in uh, microeconomics of uh, cash flow, profit and loss, uh, and expenses, how uh, we could translate uh, this, let's say, macroeconomic theory into more hands-on microeconomic. What could the uh, average business person take of that? Is there any way, because uh, you explained in the beginning of, of Hedge Fund that is basically hedging about or securing uh, investments against uh, what is going on in the market, or let's say negative effects of the market. Uh, is there any hedge that uh, is possible on the microeconomic level of everyday life of entrepreneurs and uh, business people in US? Yeah, let me, uh, I think the first thing that I can offer is the second prediction. And the second prediction is that the decelerator also works in the other direction. So if the Fed at some point starts decreasing rates uh, gradually, then you would expect that to be good news, right? You would expect that uh, this would be kind of a help uh, to the economy, but the financial decelerator actually predicts that it would uh, push the stock market even lower because of the options, because of the effect on the on the options. So, uh, you know, it's too early to to kind of rely on that. Um, you know, too too hard, but. Uh, if it's correct, then you should take that into, into consideration and not expect that once uh, rates uh, start gradually decreasing that uh, everything is good and uh, the storm is over and uh, we're in the clear. That's the first thing. The, the second the thing I would say is that uh, we could be facing some uh, challenging times uh, for two reasons. One is that we are in a restrictive monetary policy right now. And the second is we have some structural uh, deficits in uh, the energy market. So we have uh, neglected the, the oil and gas sector for uh, a couple of decades. And as a result of that, there is a shortage in uh, oil and gas uh, supply. And the US government uh, dumped a very large uh, quantity of oil into the market over the, the last uh, year. And that helped to reduce uh, the oil prices that spiked after the uh, beginning of the Ukraine war, but it was only a temporary uh, fix. Now that the US government stopped releasing oil, uh, the price jumped again. And so we have a situation where we have uh, economic tightening from two directions, both the interest rate and uh, the oil price. And that puts uh, a lot of uh, constraints on consumers. So I think that uh, business people should uh, be defensive. So the, the best way that I could say to, to hedge is to be defensive, to cut costs, to um, you know be very careful with uh, with the spending, and to uh, preserve every bit of uh, cash flow. And in terms of tailoring uh, services or products, I would tend more toward uh, promoting services that are uh, cost saving. Um, anything that is uh, more affordable, more essential, 
and to go less for the very um I don't know, uh, high techy glamorous uh, things that we, we've been seeing over the last uh, 10 years. And I think there is less uh, room for those at the moment and more room for uh, productivity enhancing uh, products, for cost saving products and services and so forth. Okay, uh, two questions uh, <laughs> that uh, just uh, uh, popped up uh, for me. One is uh, in US, it's uh, really popular to invest uh, your profits in real estate. Uh, do you think that people should continue doing that or they should just wait for about six months to see uh, how things will uh, progress with interest rates and all this? So I think that uh, the real estate in the last couple of years has been very uh, frothy and got to very... Uh, uh, high prices and uh, what happened was that uh, part of that was the Airbnb boom uh, during the pandemic many people moved to places or moved from one place to the other uh, working remotely and many people invested in, uh, in Airbnb apartments and those, uh, many of those apartments are standing uh, empty. And so there is a, a big uh, shadow inventory in the US market uh, that is not in the market right now, but some of these apartments went back into the market to be sold and they weren't uh, able to sell them. So now they're on the rental market and in any case, I personally believe that uh, the real estate market is in uh, a bubble again, and this uh, bubble will be one of the bubbles that will uh, deflate in this uh, in this coming year or two. So, obviously, the higher rates uh, cause high mortgage rates, so that completely uh, stopped any transactions uh, of uh, of uh, you know, retail uh, sales, other than uh, builders who are still selling, but what they do is they have kind of some kind of a trick. Instead of reducing the price of the home, what they do is they give you uh, help with the mortgage mm -hmm. as if it was, let's say, 1% instead of the 8%. And so they are kind of reducing the price without reducing the price. So you don't see actual uh, price decreases in the market, but in reality, there is actually some discount that is going into into these sales. And so, all I can say is, I had some properties that I sold uh, last year in uh, preparation for uh, for this. Okay, uh, great insight. I have another question that pops my mind always. Uh, with all these bubbles uh, that uh, you mentioned, uh, one of them is uh, property and uh, another one important is that stock price is uh, overpriced. So um, that they, they might be also in a bubble. Uh, is it possible that high inflation would deflate this uh, bubble? Is that something that can happen? Um. I don't think that high inflation by itself would, would deflate the bubble. I think it will reinflate the bubble on the other side, uh, probably even more uh, vigorously. But one of the problems that the Fed will have is that uh, we have uh, structural uh, forces that are causing the inflation. It's not uh, just I mean, they may, may have spiked it with too much uh, fiscal uh, stimulus and sending checks to people and so on, but this is not the only reason. Uh, there are a few reasons. One reason is that uh, after COVID, uh, companies saw that uh, they should have some uh, supply chain that is more uh, perhaps closer to home and uh, even if it costs a little more. So there's a lot of uh, deglobalization that is, uh, that is happening right now. So that's one, uh, one force, you know, after the cost reductions of outsourcing everything to China, 
it became clear that there are some uh, downsides uh, to this. The second thing is that there is some tension between, uh, you know, in the geopolitical uh, space, you know, between the uh, powers like uh, the US, China, Russia, and so that also incentivizes companies to bring uh, some manufacturing back home or closer to home and so forth. So that's one structural uh, development that is causing the inflation. The second structural development we already mentioned, which is the oil uh, market, and that causes a lot of inflation. It hurts uh, consumers through uh, gas prices, electricity prices, heating prices, so that's another structural problem that will take uh, many years to, to solve. I mean, even the, the left wings uh, of, of the politics in the world that were supporting the renewable energy understand now that it's a little bit uh, unreliable. And uh, now nuclear is becoming the new uh, option for, for clean energy. And but you know it takes years to to put in some some nuclear electricity capacity uh, in place. So this will take some time to resolve. And uh, there's another force that is uh, operating, and that is the population. So we have a decline in the uh, labor force age population. And we have a bigger cohort of uh, baby boomers or older people who are retiring. And so we have a smaller cohort of working people supporting uh, a bigger cohort overall of, uh, of consumers. And that creates uh, some tension between the bigger demand or the demand cohort, which is the overall population, and the supply cohort, which is the labor. Uh, first population. And that's, I think, you know, we have some hopes uh, regarding uh, artificial intelligence, maybe that could kick in and, and we could help uh, with this particular problem by making the labor force uh, more productive. So the all the all the, you know, the prophecy, the doom prophecies about uh, AI uh, may not come to pass. And maybe it could be a, a force for good. Uh, after all, uh, in reducing uh, inflation. Uh, would you agree with uh, one of the claims of uh, Milton Friedman was that inflation uh, is just a direct consequence of uh, full employment? So if there would be higher than 10% unemployment, then the inflation would uh, start settling. Would you agree with that? Yes, but that would be temporary, right? So mm -hmm. this would be... So I, I think you know uh, inflation could have come down if there is a recession and, and unemployment uh, you know kicks in but then on the other side of it it would come back and that would make it tricky for the fed because i think they will have to be careful not to reduce the interest rate to zero again and start the whole process uh, again from the beginning so they will have to worry about uh, the unemployment, but also they would have to worry about uh, the comeback of the uh, of the inflation once employment goes back up again. And so there is um, another force that is uh, happening because of the geopolitical tensions, and that is the um, probably the decline of the use of the US dollar as the global reserve currency. And that's another concern, I think, for the Fed, because what, what, what might happen as countries adopt uh, bilateral transactions, uh, instead of using the dollar as the medium of exchange, they just uh, exchange their own uh, currencies back and forth, then what might happen is that the demand for dollars from the global trade uh, would decline, and that would uh, cause the U.S. dollar. And I'm talking about the long term. After you know, right now it's on a on a bullish trajectory, but over you know the next 10, 20 years, I expect the U.S. dollar uh, U.S. dollar's role in global trade to decline, 
and that would reduce its uh, its value relative to other currencies. And Can I uh, currency... propose a contrarian opinion. Okay. Um, I don't believe that US dollar is in decline. Um, I do believe that it might not be as many transactions, but uh, as a mean of exchange, uh, it will all uh, it will take a long time that. Um, the things will stop be calculated in um, or at least calculated into dollar in order to make um, a comparison to their local uh, currencies. Um, I I don't uh, I, I don't see this. Uh, it, it's very popular opinion in US that US dollar is in decline. I don't see it as uh, as such. And I don't see this as a critical macroeconomic uh, factor. Mm. Uh, because, um, for example, there is a Swiss franc that is also in decline and is currently fixed to euro and it did not think bad for the Swiss economy. Uh, before US dollar was dominated, it was a uh, Swiss pound and uh, sorry, uh, um, pound sterling, so uh, the, our, our currency in UK. And yeah. uh, we, we still use it and it's still useful. Uh, so I, I I don't think this domination of dollar is so uh, important as it is presented. Uh, I do believe that it's often excuse for the structural problem that you have addressed uh, before, uh, like population. And um, also, if I understood correctly, inflation will, will not solve the bubbles, but uh, increased productivity with artificial intelligence uh, might uh, solve um the problem with uh the lack of uh, workforce that uh we are all facing it and it's same also in asia uh even with the growing population that the the, the, the actual workforce um is, is is just getting smaller and smaller by the day so yeah uh, improved productivity could could uh do something um could we could we speculate that for example average business person should they use more devices? Should they should they try to use uh, AE assisted ads to to help them uh, improve their profitability and stay in business? Uh, what's your take on that? I think it's uh, it has to be a very simple uh, calculation of uh, you know how long it would take you to to return the investment, right? So uh, presumably these are not free. But if you can uh, return the investment within, let's say, uh, six to eight months, then uh, it's probably worth uh, worthwhile uh, pursuing. So if, if you have a, an app or, or uh, some kind of uh, virtual assistant or any other productivity tool that, uh, that can reduce costs somehow or uh, or allow you to offer a new service that uh, saves costs uh, for others, then that would be a good uh, a good move, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, would you would you um, claim uh, or dare uh, to, to to say that uh, in the eighties uh, everyone uh, proposed that every everything will be done by robots? especially in the car industry. I know that you have first-hand experiences in, in the car industry. And robotization uh, took uh, much longer than anticipated because in the 80s it was like this. In the 90s, everything will be done by robots. And uh, there's going to be no need for human in the factory. They will just bring iron there and there's going to be cars uh, just uh, shipped directly uh, to, <laughs> to shops uh, from, from the... Uh, with, with robots and no people intervention and anything. But uh, we know that uh, like uh, 40 years later, we are still uh, seeing a lot of uh, workforce in, in car industry. Um, do you think that artificial intelligence might be the same? Um, well, it depends on, on what, uh, there are many types of artificial intelligence, as you know. So some of them are uh, much less uh, complicated to implement than, than robots. Uh, if it's an app on a computer or a virtual assistant, uh, as long as you're talking about uh, software, mostly, 
It's uh, much easier to iterate on, much easier to improve. So I expect uh, artificial intelligence to, to increase productivity much quicker uh, than robots. And I think that, you know, when people talk about robots, it's really, I think the, the understanding has to start from, from, from a business goal. So the thinking has to be, what, what are you trying to accomplish? uh with a robot and uh, just saying we want to replace there has to be a, bus a clear business case and a clear uh, reason or a hypothesis of how the robot is going to change the the process of production uh you know like you always say it's about uh, redesigning the process, right? So I think Tesla really used robotics in a smart way by redesigning the process instead of just uh, patching on top of an existing process and making, you know, just adding a robot to, to put instead of a person, that usually doesn't work. So usually you would want to uh, rethink the process uh, if you want to design robots, what exactly are you trying to achieve by that? And to design the whole production line, your whole uh, production process, your whole, your whole uh, provisioning process with this new um, technology, whether it's robots or AI and so forth. And then you can see what is the gap between where you are today and what your vision is. Uh, for the future and design a path of how you transition gradually from where you are to where you want to be. I think that's a more a holistic way to, to address it. Okay, thank, thank you for uh, all these insights. I have one more question I cannot uh, uh, withstand not to ask you <laughs> while uh, we are in the interview. And that is, um, as a conservative treasurer, I always uh, recommend that everyone and not to use uh, leverage. However, you're a hedge fund manager and I'm sure you can um, hedge against uh, higher interest rates or uh, variable interest rates. Uh, what, what would you recommend to an average uh, business person in, in US? Uh, should they use leverage? Should they continue to use leverage? How, how could uh, they protect themselves against interest rate? Uh, what is the best hatch to go for this uncertainty what's your take on that um so first of all the interest rate is so high that leverage doesn't make any sense uh, at this point that's why you know real estate investing is also not uh, not economical at this point because the interest that you would pay on the on the loan is so high so leverage absolutely doesn't make uh, any sense at this point. I, uh, I obtain leverage by using options, mm -hmm. uh, not by using loans or margin and so on. And um, I think that uh, there are ways to protect yourselves. I, I think that the should be the, you should choose for the most uh, uh, let's say conservative uh, approaches so i i can't you know make any recommendations but when i sold my real estate i put some of my money into uh, short-term uh, government bonds to just give me some safe interest rates until i see what uh, you know what is going to to happen in the next uh, year or two um, but i wouldn't uh, you know, short uh, treasuries or all the, you know, there, there are many large uh, hedge funds that are doing all sorts of uh, interest rates, uh, plays like uh, shorting long term uh, bonds and buying with that money, uh, uh, shorting uh, long term bonds and buying uh, uh, shorter term uh, bonds with higher interest rates. Uh, that's not for uh, most people, including myself, I think it's uh, there's some uh, risk to that. So. Right. 
Thank you for all these beautiful insights. Uh, where would be the best uh, place to reach you if uh, some of our audience uh, would like to start following you and uh, get in contact with you? So you can uh, look me up at uh, economicdefensefund.com. That's my fund. And I also have a Substack uh, newsletter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called ecomdef.substack.com. Uh, and uh, that's uh, mostly where you can, uh, you can find me. Okay, I will include links uh, in the description. Uh, thank you, Amir, for uh, being my guest tonight. And um, I hope that listeners have uh, had a lot of uh, useful info from macroeconomics uh, into microeconomics. Okay, thank you very much for having me.